Hearing Loss Live Talks Misconceptions. Hi. Welcome to Hearing Loss Live. I'm going to start off right off the bat. I got dogs in the bedroom with me, so who knows who will break out in howls and barking and, and God knows what. So apologies ahead of time. Today, we are going to talk misconceptions. If you have a hearing loss, you know there's a lot of misconception, not only in the hearing loss world, but also in the hearing world. We hope today to help with some of those misconceptions so the next time you're talking with a hard of hearing person or you have a hearing loss and you're new to it, you understand some of these misconceptions and can help your friends and family and coworkers understand what it is you really need. Michelle Linder, can you help by starting us out on some of the misconceptions you'd like people to understand and be aware of? Thank you, Julia. Um, uh, several years ago, I wrote a um, blog article for the Say What Club, and it was entitled Six Common Misconceptions About People with Hearing Loss. And it was kind of focused at the time on the things that my family get wrong about me. And it kind of, um, I think the inspiration for that blog article came when my adult daughter was at my house and um, we were talking and I was banging around in the kitchen and I said something about how people who are deaf and hard of hearing are very noisy. And she kind of looks perplexed and she said, you know, I never realized that mom, when you were banging around in the kitchen when I was a kid, I always thought you were mad. And I said, well, how come you thought that? And she thought about it for a minute and she said, because dad always made it seem like you were mad. And so that started me thinking on how um, I often get a bad rap in my family, and I'm sure a lot of people do from those who are closest to us. Um, so it made me think of some other things, and I focused on six misconceptions that we're always angry, um, we're disinterested and antisocial, we purposely ignore you, we're controlling and rude. We love to ask questions, and hearing loss is equally hard for our hearing family members than it is for us. I'm not going to talk about all of those, but I did want to talk about one other thing, and that was the questions thing. I drive my family insane asking questions, and the reason that um, people who are hard of hearing do that is because we no longer overhear other people talking, um, even when we're in the same room, in the same car. I'll give you an example of that. Um, usually it's when I'm out with my family on an outing or we're traveling together and I seem to never know what the plan of the day is, or we might've made a plan, but then the plan changed, but I don't know about it because I can't overhear people talking about changing plans. So this summer, I was visiting my son in Portland, and um, that morning we had gone to my daughter-in-law's birthday brunch at her parents' um, place, and then we were leaving um, in the afternoon. We were going to her cousin's house because they have the same birthday, and Rachel was having a party, and so um, we were headed there, and we made a stop at my son and daughter-in-law's apartment, and I just assumed that they'd forgotten something, you know, Natalie was going to run in and pick something up, so my son pulled to the curb, Natalie got out, and of course, I just sat there, and my son looked back at me with kind of a irritated tone in his voice and said, are you going to get out, mom? And I said, well, I don't know that I'm supposed to get out. I'm not really sure what's happening here. So if you need me to get out of the car, um, you need to tell me that because I can't overhear anything that you and Natalie were talking about. And so then he apologized. And, and that's what I mean about always seeming to get a bad rap in my family. Um, 
because I have to ask so many questions or I never know what's going on. So those are some of the misconceptions that my own family um, has with me and some of the negative dynamics in my family. And so um, that was an interesting blog article and a lot of people responded to it because I think other people um, have the same problems in their families. Thank you, Michelle. And, and you know what, but grandma did ask questions that you would think, why are you asking me that again? I, I just answered that. And that makes more sense to me because they're trying to process what they've heard to make sure it's understood and put the words together. Shelly, what are some misconceptions you'd like folks to understand? Uh, thank you. And I think the first one I will go on will be that I think that I, I'm too good of a hard of hearing person. <laughs> I operate well as a hard of hearing person. So people often forget that I am hard of hearing and then get irritated when I'm not facing them. Um, and they, they say something and then have to repeat it. So I don't know if that's really a misconception or not, but I think Michelle has mentioned before that she can get away without telling people she's hard of hearing until something pops up and then we got to say what is. <laughs> and it, 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 family members, I will say again, are the ones that almost forget that you're hard of hearing because I do so well at home most of the time. So it's a curse and a blessing. <laughs> I'm glad I do that well, but it also makes people, makes it easy for people to forget what I actually need. So that's the one conception. And another conception that I'd like to talk about is lip reading because, uh, well, for me, when I was learning to lip read, I felt like I had to hang on every word. I needed to know every word to be a lip reader. And it's not the case. And I had to let that go because it's not just lip reading. It's also facial expressions, body language, anticipation and all that stuff. And when I got that in my head, I was able to let go of the need to hear every or see every word. And um, I, that helped me relax actually. And it made lip reading more possible. Thank you, Shelly, this is Julia. I wanna kind of go on that misconception a little further because people without the hearing loss, people who are hearing have a misconception that you lose your hearing, you're an automatic lip reader. And sometimes, sometimes not. Um, I think we've met many students who really, really struggle to understand the concept of, of lip reading because they just want every word and it's not possible. And I think it gets taken to a point where, you know, somebody who is maybe really good at lip reading, it's misconstrued when they can't quite lip read for eight or nine hours solid. Um, you know, I, if you're hearing, turn off your sound, pick a program on whatever channel without the captions. Can, what can you read? Because if you lost your hearing tomorrow, that's how your lip reading is going to start. And that's where you're going to need to start at. And I honestly, I didn't pick up on that until I actually took a lip reading class um, or joined a lip reading class. I think my first one I captioned. So I don't know if that counts or not, but it really was enlightening to find out just how difficult lip reading really is. It, it's a whole lot involved, not just looking at somebody's lips and catching every word. So um, it, it gave me a better respect to understanding um, 
when you have a family member getting met. My grandma was a proficient lip reader. Um, her and Michelle, and there's one other lady I know that that was that I truly a proficient lip reader. Um, so I didn't know what it took for lip reading. I thought it was natural. I really did. Um, it, it's very enlightening as a class. Shelly, I saw you doing this. <laughs> I was a kid. I've been teaching lip reading classes for at least seven years, I think. And we had a, a couple come in one time where the wife was hard of hearing. She, I think she had a severe hearing loss. And the husband came in, keep her company, you know, just to go to class with her. And, and I think it was about four or five or maybe six classes in, he was just completely amazed how much she was lip reading. He had no clue. And he told me that that class helped him to uh, better communicate with his wife. So if spouses can attend lip reading classes, they learn a lot. Julia is a hearing person and she's picking up on lip reading because she's taught the class too. So. There are misconceptions about lip reading, and it can be liberating. <laughs> I just wanted to respond to something that Shelley said. Um, and those of us who cope really well with hearing loss, it's a real double-edged sword. Um, people don't think that we're not hearing and you know I had severe hearing loss in some ranges in high school and no one in my high school except for my closest friend and my boyfriend really knew that I had a hearing loss um, just because I coped so well I wish I would have known how to tell people back then but I didn't but um it really is a, a mixed blessing and a mixed curse that you cope so well because um, people don't realize how hard it is for you and how severe your hearing loss is. I know when I would be traveling um, probably 20 years ago, a lot of things have changed, thank goodness. But 20 years ago, um, because I speak clearly, hardly anyone would believe that I had a hearing loss. And so I experimented and I traveled a bunch during one summer, like 16 or 18 flights in the summer. And so I experimented. And the one that I got the most accommodation with was where I didn't use my voice because my voice gives people the misconception that, oh, she really can hear so there's all kinds of misconceptions that have to do with lip reading and coping. And um, anyway, it's really interesting, but for us, it can be frustrating. <laughs> it's Julia. And I know we talk about this often, but I think another misconception is hearing aids on both sides. Um, the hearing person says, go get hearing aids. It'll fix everything. And, and the person with the hearing loss, it may or may not. And, and you need to be ready for that. I, also, my other one is cochlear implants. I've seen that um, over the years, uh, couples who've come in and he's got a cochlear implant. He still can't hear me because they just, they, they're not, they don't do their research, I guess. And I'm not sure how to fix that. But if you're the, that, you know, if you're one of their kiddos and your your parents are looking at this and they're elderly, help them be prepared for how it may or may not um, change their life. And then we see we see other couples, both couples have a hearing hearing loss and one uses his hearing aid all the time and the other one won't. <laughs> he doesn't know why she won't. And it, so it, there's a lot of misconceptions around how to fix the hearing loss and, and that's individualized, but both sides need to come together and, and talk it out. What other misconceptions, Shelley? I'll just go on the hearing aids a little bit more because hearing aids aren't called hearing miracles for a reason, but it's like 
hearing people expect it to be the miracle. Oh my God, if she just gets hearing aids, she'll hear on the phone. <laughs> that was my first misconception many years ago <laughs> and my mom's. Um, <clears throat> so there's still a lot of work with hearing aids and the get, get their attention first, face them, be within six feet because hearing aids have their limits and not knowing those limits actually completely eroded my confidence with hearing loss many years ago because I thought they were hearing miracles and I didn't understand why I was not understanding speech still. And you know, when people say, are your ears on or turn up your volume, it's just devastating almost because Without knowing it all, you just feel like something's wrong with you. And then and then you find the limitations and then you're like, oh, it wasn't me. So so that is a misconception too. Um, I just wanted to mention, Shelly, since you worked um, at the state services in Utah, you were the hard of hearing specialist for a long time. I, I know when you s told me um, way back that uh, the deaf side of the state services had some of the same misconceptions about hard of hearing as hearing people do. And I thought about that. And I mean, that makes sense because we have very different experiences. We have very different needs. Um, but I, I can't really remember specifically um, anything that you um, were talking about. But I just remember it was really interesting. Um, could you share some something about that? It, there was several people on the hearing side, interpreter side, or hearing and fluent and sign language side that knew absolutely nothing about hearing loss. <laughs> I, and I laugh, but it, it's sad because I, I found myself educating them, the deaf, as much as I was uh, hearing people trying to clear up some of those misconceptions. And, you know, when was, what was it? He wanted, oh, he thought we just heard a lower volume and evenly across. And then I had to explain that though there's the, like the different frequencies missing and you hear this well, but you can't hear that well. And oh, so hearing aids, you know, really don't fix it. <laughs> Again, they thought hearing aids fixed it. And a vocational rehab counselor a long time said, you know, you, you can hear, I don't know how I can help you, even though you're struggling at work. Yeah. And so there was that. And to me, they, they seemed to think that hearing loss was something that I can teach people. And, and I can, and I do, and I have. But when I went to hire somebody, I wanted somebody who was already knowledgeable with hearing loss because they get it. And it also empowers them because they're using their hearing loss experience to help other people. So they, we got in an argument, <laughs> a back and forth one time about me trying to hire somebody who was hearing, but she got it. She understood it. She'd been a hard of hearing assistant before, and she worked for uh, another uh, phone company or, or Relay Utah here. And I'm like, okay, she's the one because she gets it. But they wanted me to hire somebody else because they knew ASL or sign language. And I was like, but that person is not going to be uh, well represented, uh, a good representative for hearing loss as this person will be. So that, there was quite the misconception there because they thought, again, you know, just, it's just, no, I can't say more. I'm stopping there. <laughs> I'm very thankful that you um, held your ground on that one. I, I won't say any more than that, but the person you're talking about works very hard to represent those with a hearing loss. 
and what their needs are and researching what they need. And, and that is what a hard of hearing specialist should do, whether they are hearing um, hard of hearing or, or deaf culture, that's, that's the job description, right? So thank you for, for doing that for Utah. I, I think that was a great last uh, kudos for you before you decided we were ready to do Hearing Loss Live. I'm glad we're here. Um, I think family members really, really should look into, um, they can't walk the walk. They do have some of their own issues and grief to go through. And I think we'll have a podcast here shortly about that as well. But they need to take a minute and get in their loved ones hearing loss shoes. Um, they need to be honest about hearing aids are great. And we've already said a couple of times, if hearing aids are what can help you do it sooner than later, it will make a bigger difference. But have a plan. Is your communication going to be more about silence together? Can you sit together and not have to talk? Um, what what does your relationship look like when those little changes? Don't tell the person to go learn sign language unless you're willing to go with them and learn sign language. Because that person, though they want to know gestures for everyday life, they're, they're learning sign language to communicate with you. Um, those are some important things. And I really would hope companies look more into um, going above and beyond I'm going to say it above and beyond the ADA, Americans with Disability Act. Please stop learning just the basics of what accommodations might be out there and thinking that all hearing loss individuals need this or that. Please learn all of the stuff in between this and that so that you can best have an inclusive work environment. I think I go on and on every week about that, right? Um, if it even just gets to one company, I'll be happy at this point. If it gets to many, I'll be ecstatic, right? Um, I want a minute to think about one of the misconceptions and how to talk about it that I think I see the most, but I've got to come up with some words. <laughs> some some non-offensive words. So I'm going to be, I'm going to be quiet for a minute. Michelle. I just had a real quick short story while Julia thinks here. Um, one of the points in the article I wrote was um, sometimes I, I meet mixed couples where one of the um, people has hearing loss and the other one's hearing, and that's a common occurrence. Um, but I've had the hearing spouse of somebody with hearing loss argue that their challenges are just as um, weighty as the person with hearing loss. And while they can be, um, uh, it's not the same. And so I found myself trying to find a way to let this woman know um, how it's different. And so, um, because she was just adamant about she had just as much, um, you know, weight with hearing loss as her husband did. And I said, well, think about it this way. Um, your husband is likely the only person that you know in your life. And he was, he was the only person that she had to deal with that had hearing loss. And so you're having to deal with communication with him, one person. But for him, every single person he meets is a communication challenge. And he has to deal with multiple people throughout his day. And so when you look at it that way, um, it can't compare. We are just so over 
stimulated sometimes, so challenged with communication. Um, you know, we might meet 20 people on a busy day and we have to struggle to communicate with all 20 of those people. We're likely the only person that they're struggling to communicate with. So that's something to think about. And I don't want to minimize um, the challenges of hearing family members at all. They do have a tough road to hoe, but it's not the same. And to argue that it is, um, I just had to say something. So, thank you, Michelle. And and that's true. That you know, I, I thoroughly agree. I think one of the things um, I wish families better understood is the anger management behind it. Um, And understanding, I, I, yelling doesn't answer, right? Yelling at the person because this time they didn't hear you where last time maybe they did um, is, not, is never going to help the situation. Now, if that's the way your family is, then your family already knows that whether you have a hearing loss or not. But... Um, Learning better techniques that may or may not work every time is going to help in the long run and figuring out anger management um, is, is a big issue, I think. Um, it's still something I work on. My grandma's passed away. I didn't have anger problems, but I've got other anger problems going on in my family with hearing loss. And, and so making sure in check what I'm being angry about is very, very important. Shelley? Uh, in the, the Say What Club convention that we had in Savannah, Georgia, we actually had a workshop where the hard of hearing people went to one part of the room and the uh, hearing spouses, family members went to the other side of the room. You could you know, from my end over here, you know, body language and all that, I could see them getting all heated up over there. <laughs> you know, it's not to say they don't have issues. But I, I agree with Michelle, you know, we, everybody we meet, we have a hard time communicating with. But so I know they feel a lot of the grief and, and they, they get to, um, they cut out some of their activities and regards for us because they feel guilty and stuff. Um, but that was a really good workshop. And I feel like the family got members got validated as much as the hard of hearing people got validated over here with, with all of our gripes and trying to communicate across to each other. And this is something we, we talk about doing when we can get together in person again, or maybe even online, we would we'd really like to get families together to help each other understand more about the communication issues. Thank you, Shelley. I, I, I was trying to figure out how to, my anger has to do with that misconception point, right? Well, you heard me a minute ago. Why can't you hear me now? Um, and, and what the reason behind that is. And, and, and I love that idea. I think that would be a great workshop, whether online or, or in person or both. Um, cause I, I do, I think I've said it before too, it, hearing friends and family attend a social event, attend a workshop, attend a class, um, and, and learn more you just learn so much more about misconceptions you don't even know you have. I, I, I think there's many that I've probably even at this point forgotten about, um, you know, misconception. If you can't see me, you can't hear me. I, I started using that with clients long ago, but I know I learned it from some type of social event that involved better communication and, and how to, and that, over dramatic. It is not going to help you understand me. It's just going to piss you off. <laughs> so 
Well, this is Shelly, and I'll say that, you know, the, um, the family thing, you heard me before, why, why can't you hear me now? We go through this, and there are even times still where I ask myself, you know, uh, Ken said something, I understood him. And then I'm in the situation where we're in a car and he talked low into the window, to the passenger window while I was driving <laughs> last week. And I understood what he said. And I'm like, uh, I, I don't get it. Like, wh why did I hear that when it, most of the time in the car I struggle? And so I, I, I let it go, you know? <laughs> it was one of those moments, hard of hearing moments where you're like, well, do I let this go or not? <laughs> And I was, I just finally decided just, just let it go. <laughs> you sure you weren't lip reading in the window, Shelly? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Michelle. You know, when uh, I think Shelly and I were brainstorming about um, doing some kind of workshop with um, hearing family members and their loved ones, but I, I thought we should do something kind of like wife swap, where you don't actually get in a group with your own family members, you mix it up and you kind of pair someone who is hearing loss with another family, because I think you would get very different dynamic than when you're with your own family. I think if you're with your own family members, that could lead to some arguments or some blaming and things like that. I think it would be very revealing if you could um, pair hearing family members with someone else who is hard of hearing and see how maybe um, they react differently and then let their, their hard of hearing family member watch that um, afterwards. I think it would be very revealing. There we go. Hearing loss live. I don't know how to name that. <laughs> um, uh, I'll leave it at that. Shelly? Family boot camp. <laughs> there you go. Family boot camp. What else do you guys want to talk about when it comes to misconceptions? Good. Well, we hope this helps you with some of your misconceptions. Remember to read our blog because there's some more in there as well. Remember to like us on your, your social media. Subscribe to our YouTube page. That way you can maybe get the blogs and the uh, podcast a little earlier sometimes. And we hope you're looking forward to our lip reading concept class because we're really excited to help you better understand how lip reading works. Thanks for joining us. Join Hearing Loss Live next week when we talk with McLean Drake of Vibe Music.